<laughs> you've got some part of everything in you, right? Yeah. Like all kinds of movies. We're yeah. Frankenstein. We're proletariats. We grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. We we're working class kids. Uh, the city made fun of. What do you specifically like about Dhanush as an actor? And the DOP finally just shook his head and said, the greed of the Russos. Yes. <laughs> Tell me more about the greed of the Russos. <laughs> Joe and Anthony, so lovely to have you on Film Companion. Thank you. Um, congratulations on The Grey Man. Thank you. I yeah. want to begin by asking you about the art of the blockbuster. Yes. Okay, um, it's such a difficult thing to do, um, you know, to wrestle massive budgets and stars and action and emotion and put it into a narrative that then talks to a billion people right. around the world. Yeah. And you do this again and again. And even though your roots were in indie cinema, right. uh, what have you discovered in all these years about the DNA of commercial filmmaking? You know, it's interesting because, you know, part of the reason, our process to understand like what to put out there in a movie really comes from a process of Joe and I looking inside ourselves. And I think we're just speaking to that part of our, a specific part of ourselves with every movie. You know, in our indie phase, we could speak to a part of ourselves that's a little more mischievous and, and sort of contrary and-, and Indulgent. And indulgent, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whereas like when we're, when we're making cinema that we want to reach a wide audience because that's the design of the narrative and the production, you know, we're speaking to the part of ourselves that like wa wants a movie, in, you know, on that level. Wants to be entertained, to wants to have fun, wants spectacle, wants, you know, what are the, what are the moments that we want out of that kind of story? And, um, you know, we, we, we say it ad nauseum, but the way that we access who we are as filmmakers was uh, based on who we were as film fans growing up. And so we loved the French New Wave. We loved Star Wars. We loved anime. We loved Dobie Gillis. We let, you know, they go down the list of, you know, pop culture, um, um, you know, massive pop culture uh, uh, um, content. And, you know, we ran the gamut. So I think it, we really do just calibrate to the parts of ourselves that, you know, adore that style uh, of filmmaking, depending on which one we're you know, we're currently engaged in. But when you are so successful, like the two of you are, uh, when it's all about, also all about the grosses, right? right. Uh, not with the gray man. It's an important <laughs> part of it. It's called the film business. It is for called a reason, the film business, right? This exactly. is a very expensive movie. It needs a return on the investment. Absolutely. And, yeah. But how do you as artists disconnect from that pressure of having to deliver that? Well, the way we understand it as artists is, look, we have a variety of tools that we can use to make a movie. Sometimes those tools are simple tools and we can have fun with those tools. Sometimes the tools are very elaborate. Now, when you're making a movie like The Gray Man, like a blockbuster that, as you describe it, you're using an expensive set of tools. Like movies take money to make, right? And you know, you can make money, you know, it's, it's, you can make movies for whatever, dollar amount you want. But when if you're going to say, hey, let's go to work and use these really expensive tools to try to create a version of cinema that has a level of scope and energy that is only achievable through these tools, then we know right from the beginning, okay, this is an expensive movie. In order to make it an expensive movie, it has to reach a wide audience. So if it, you know, that's when we start to speak to that part of ourselves that's like, oh, okay, we need to be able to walk in the movie theater and have a great time, be excited, be thrilled, be surprised, and be really entertained. And like, that's, that's the mode we need to go into on this movie if we're gonna use that expensive set of tools. If we're gonna use like a, a, a more modest set of tools, then we can speak to different parts of ourselves. We can be more indulgent, we can be more obscure, we can But be that's more... so fabulous because you're all of it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You've got some part of everything in you, right? Yeah. Like all kinds of movies. We're yeah. Frankenstein <laughs> <laughs> in a lot of ways. I mean, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was the diverse, eccentric influences growing up. We don't, I don't know, we don't, we're not like prejudicial towards, we never really used, 
artistry is like a, a way to define how we responded to things. You're not snobs about it. We're not snobs at all. Yeah. We can't stand snobs, frankly. Yeah. It's sort of a distasteful component of cinema. You know, so it really, um, for us, like we were proletariats. We grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. We were working class kids. Uh, the city made fun of, it was made fun of while we were growing up relentlessly. And so we just don't, I, I don't know, we've never associated or felt like, uh, um, you know, uh, it was, you know, criticism was at all interesting to us in any way, you know. Um, uh, and so, you know, we're, we're more engaged in the act of doing and we're more engaged by inclusion than we are by exclusion. And I would argue that, you know, um, that there's a precociousness, a toxic precociousness sometimes around cinema that is exclusionary. It tries to have some sort of intellectual mm. barrier to it. We're highly resistant to that uh, and, um, and prefer to make movies that work in the US and Germany and India and China and Japan. And, you know, that's inclusion. Yeah. That is community. We want to bind people together through stories rather than to like create a niche that, you know, hey, you're either in this club because you can understand what we're trying to accomplish here or go over there with the, you know, with the, uh, with the plebes. Um, uh, it's just um, sort of the distasteful aspect of it. And, you know, it's interesting is that it feels like everything is um, like there's an extremist element to everything now. Mm. Yeah. You know, and there's almost this sort of incel level of insanity to like film culture on the internet. It's gone nuts. Uh, and uh, it's sad. Uh, um, again, because I think, um, you know, it's a way for people to try to define themselves against others. Yeah where I think we should be trying to embrace uh, each other uh, rather than trying to highlight, you know, our differences. Well, you like that, so you can't, you know, you, right. you're, Judging people by you're not as valuable as I am right. because I can appreciate this. Yeah. And I, I just, I don't know, it's just a, uh, it's an unfortunate aspect of, uh, of, of, of the world at the moment. Tell me... Um what do you specifically like about Dhanush as an actor? And how hard was it to write him in? Yeah. Yeah. So Dhanush has, he has an immense amount of screen presence. And you see it in his energy. Like, he has a calmness to him, a focus to him, and a simplicity to him that allows him to ground himself in, like, what's most essential in any given moment. And that really has a powerful effect on screen. It's almost like he's this kind of force that like everything starts to revolve around, you know, because because he is so centered, you know, so that that's he, something he's very still performer. Like, yeah, he, he is, can move between his movements are so um, precise. Yeah, I think that's what you know, why your eye is so attracted to him, because everything else moving on frame, he is extremely still that, that, spiritually still. Yeah. And I think that's what we, that was something we appreciated about him as a performer prior to working with him. And then we, we were really thrilled to be able to use that in this movie because this movie's like, there's so many moving parts in this film. There's so many people after the gray man, but he's this one. So one of the things coming after the gray man just has this stillness to him and this focus. And you could sort of get this feeling like, oh yeah, that's actually going to get, get it. Get, get you know because because of its because of that quality so anyway I, it, we it's, it's always exciting when you can sort of uh, figure out how to use the qualities of an actor that you most love in a character and in a film and I feel like we were able to do that on this speaking of things coming after the gray man the action sequences are just staggering uh, especially that one in Prague yeah. uh, I kept thinking okay they're not going to be able to top this. And then and yeah. then it keeps going. And then something else happens that, that just takes it up another notch. Uh, you know, when you design something like that, both of you have always talked about rooting action in character. Right. But when you design something like that, how do you do it? How do you like, is it like, okay, we have to have him handcuffed and then see a little bit of humor because that's who this it's man is? It's painstaking. Yeah. yeah. You're right. Yeah. But like you're building a house. And, uh, and you're building it one brick at a time. And a sequence like that is exhausting. 
because you're constantly trying to wrangle it and make sure that the action doesn't get away from the character. The brain can only handle about 30 seconds of you know, unstructured chaos, and then it starts to shut down, and you start to think about what you want for dinner, or the fact that you forgot to do your laundry. Now you've lost the audience. Um, so you have to keep checking in with the character, and you're also trying to manage tone. How intense is this supposed to be? How serious is it supposed to get? How is the, how is the lead character responding to it? You know, uh, and, and it's tricky because that is a sequence. This is an edgier action film where, you know, these mercenaries are shooting up a city and they're killing police officers. And you know, how is the gray man reacting to that? He has a moral code. You know, there's moments of Ryan wincing as they're shooting up uh, um, police cars and. So you're tracking a lot of things throughout that sequence. It's about as hard as it gets, I think. Yeah. It's, it's all, it's made up of so many small shots. But for you to put your finger on that sequence is a, sort of a, along the lines of designing around character. I mean, that sequence is a perfect example of it in the sense that certainly it's large, so it draws attention because of the scope of the sequence. But it's also um, really powerful on a character level because we've in, been introduced to this character of the gray man in the film. He's a character that lives in the shadows. He's a character who nobody, that people don't know about. He has no records, etc. He's this very unknowable ghost-like figure. All of a sudden, this sequence begins by him being handcuffed to a bench in a busy city square in Prague where the police are looking at him. There's teams of assassins looking at him. There's people on the other side of the world through surveillance equipment looking at him. He's the, he, the gray man, all eyes are on the gray man. And that's the inversion of right. like what his process has been. And you know, that, so in many ways, it's his biggest test on an action level. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating for me that um, your writing collaborators, Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely, are also partners in your production company. That's right, yeah. You don't see that very often. How did you arrive at that decision? We just, it was our working relationship with uh, Marcus and McFeely through the four films we made together uh, for the, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, Joe and I have a very collaborative process. You know, it, simply the fact that we work as a team speaks to that. And they also work as a team. And then the four of us were just able to really have a very successful collaboration on those movies. We uh, work with them differently than you would imagine. You know, normally writers and directors collaborate. We spend a lot of time on the script phase, working intensely with them in a room together, talking through the story month after month in a uh, room. But then as we move into our directing uh, phase, we also stay in very close contact with them about how the movie's evolving on a creative level, and they have a lot of input all the way through production. So uh, it's just, it, it came from that experience that we had making those Marvel movies. We just thought, we love telling stories like this. Let's form our own company where we can continue to explore um, long form narratives and, and uh, narrative universes together. Uh, and The Gray Man is sort of the first example of that. You know, um, I read this interview, Anthony, where you talked about a film that the two of you were making, um, and you kept push pushing for more. You kept like just saying, no, no, a little better, a little better. And, and the DOP finally just shook his head and said, the greed of the Russos. Yes, <laughs> we do push our crew. <laughs> and uh, I love that story. Yeah. And I, I want to know, tell me more about the greed of the Russos. You know, what do you most want to accomplish when you're making a film? Well, I look at we're uniquely positioned. You know, when you're a director, it's your job. You're, you're with an amazing team of collaborators, right? And it's your job to continue to uh, to push for more truth, to reach further, to challenge yourself farther. I mean, you always know you're in a good pr place creatively when you're a little scared and when there's a little risk involved. So it's I think the greed is just us trying to create scenarios where we're all feeling the risk and we're all reaching just a little bit further than we think we're capable of in order to try to find something new and, and discover something new and create something. So to me, I think that's the, the heart of the greed. I don't know if you define it differently, but... Instead of six action sequences, there's nine action sequences. <laughs> and that the is the greed of that's the Russos. The greed, yes. <laughs> Maybe that's the excess of the Russos. I would have thought that, yeah. Well, hey, it's a good thing. Yeah. It's a good thing. Okay, last question. Kevin Feige described you both as yeah. 
equally visionaries and pragmatists. Yeah. Is that about right? I think it's pretty, pretty accurate. Cool, I mean, yeah. I think it's what I was talking a little bit about earlier, right, is that we have a level of pragmatism to us about, you know, um, I don't know, it's urbane, I guess. It's sort of this notion that, like, maybe we're existentialists. I don't know that, like, there's not, uh, there's no point in, like, being too precious about anything because I don't know if you saw the images from the Webb telescope, but, yeah. you know, we are, we're amoebas, you know? against the scale of the universe. So that's where the pragmatic side of us comes in. And it's very, uh, and it, it, it informs the way that we work. We're efficient, we're practical. We try to be as nice as possible to everyone involved. Um, there's no stress, you know, we're not, we're not so driven that, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, push our crews to the brink of breaking, uh, um, you know, so it's a, it's a, that's the pragmatic side of us is like, okay, what can we accomplish realistically uh, and humanely? Uh, um, and then I guess the visionary side of us is really just, I don't know how to describe that best. Maybe you, you know how to describe visionary. it better, but it's really, it's, it's ambition, I think. Yeah. And maybe there's a scale to it, but you know, like we like things that feel familiar, that have strange elements um, I'm squished into them, right? So the gray man is a very familiar territory, uh, but it's got a very modern hero uh, who doesn't want to be a spy. He's completely unglamorous, right? Rejects, you know, the idea of being a spy, uh, reacting against a corrupt patriarchy, the, uh, the traditional agency that's, you know, like the MI6, the CIA, it's completely corrupt. You know, so we're just twisting things slightly. Strong female lead, a zero romantic relationship. So it's just, you know, Danush, you know, diversity. We're just doing things, we're just calibrating things in a way that, um, that you know, still keep it accessible, still allow you to grab on to that comfort food of genre, but just twist it enough that, you know, it, it has a more modern connection to the audience. Uh, and I think maybe that's the vision. That's how we marry our, our pragmatism to the vision. Uh, uh, that's probably the best way I can describe it. Yeah. I can still see it. Well, it sounds wonderful, and you're doing a great job. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. There's amazing questions. Yeah. Thank you.